Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best of the best to help you scale from 1 million to 1 trillion. Today with us, we have a very special guest. His name is Luis Fernandez, the co-founder and CEO at Tink. Luis, welcome to the show. Hello, Mike. How are you doing? Nice to finally talk to you, to get the chance to talk to you and, and be on your podcast. And great and honor to be here. Absolutely. Like, likewise. And thanks for, for making the time to be with us. And that's great news because it's the first company that is joining from Mexico uh, City. And so we really want, uh, and we have guests from all over the world. And uh, we want to have a, a good representation of uh, all the countries and all the SaaS businesses and large enterprises that are uh, playing in, in the global uh, marketplace. So really an honor to, to have you here. Let's get to know a little bit more about yourself and about your company. So uh, how did you went starting up uh, Tink and what were you doing before and what is the vision of the company? Just give, give, give us, please, a, an overview um, about yourself and the company. Of course. Uh, well, first of all, I'm really uh, honored to be part of, uh, you know, the first company to be here uh, of the Mexican market. Uh, hopefully there will be much, uh, many others to come. Uh, and I will be sure to uh, get, get, get you a couple of contacts of people in Mexico that have a really good <laughs> Thank you, really appreciate it. Well, uh, I'm a clinical engineer. I uh, work with medical equipment and that's how practically this, this adventure started. Um, I graduated college in 2012 and my first job was to um, go through uh, one of the norther northern states in Mexico, which is borders with Arizona, which is called Sonora. Um, so I, I went there, uh, I was involved in the project regarding uh, medical equipment uh, management. So one of the areas of uh, biomedical engineering, which is our mother discipline, let's say, is clinical engineering. And what a clinical engineer does is uh, we are, uh, well, we have to make sure that medical technology in hospitals works uh, accurately, safely, and is available whenever it's needed. So we practically take care of medical technology the way a doctor takes care of a patient. So our patients are, are medical equipment, such as vital signs monitors, uh, defibrillators, ventilators, etc. So my first job was to uh, do an assessment of uh, over 30 hospitals in the, the state of Sonora. And one of my deliverables was uh, uh, an inventory of all the medical equipment units uh, there. Um, so whenever you think of inventory, you think of an Excel spreadsheet, right? So there, there's, uh, this is where the problem starts. And this is practically the main reason that we started Tink. When, when I started uh, well, doing this assessment of all the medical equipment that, uh, that the state of Sonora had, well, I, I mean, I got huge problems. You know, in Excel, you can uh, just make errors, uh, grammatical errors. Uh, I mean, uh, Phillips with, the, with one L is... Uh, uh, a brand that represents one types of uh, devices and Philips with double L is another, you know, brand. So we have a lot of duplicity. We have a lot of mistakes that lead to a lot of problems in hospitals. So this is uh, mainly why we started the company. We decided to uh, build a tool which uh, was easy to use for Mexican clinical engineers. Uh, we, we wanted to hire one of these tools, but we you know, just found out that in Latin America, there weren't no no tools available because uh, at the end of the day, a SaaS for the States is very different than a SaaS for Mexico, which we have right. huge different realities. We have, uh, you know, uh, different uh, procurement budgets, etc. So this is why we decided to create a, a, a medical equipment management platform that helped uh, hospitals know how many devices they own, uh, knowing what states uh, functionality wise uh, there are, for example, how many are available, how many need uh, repairing, uh, how many devices need to be changed, how many need to be decommissioned, etc. So uh, we started out in 2018. I mean, it was a long journey of uh, thinking and uh, just, uh, you know, thinking about what we're going to do, etc. I worked in a couple of companies, of course, and then in 2015, we decided to create the minimum viable product uh, while working in a company. So we were an entrepreneurship uh, an example because we, okay. we, we started with an MVP inside a company for the company's purpose. So the, the software was so good that a lot of customers started 
searching for the software instead of the company. So in 2018, uh, me and my partner, who is also a biomedical engineer, decided to purchase the software that we had built and designed for the company and built the software company out of it in 2018. So we started out with uh, 35 customers, uh, which were hospitals, both private and public. Then we started out with uh, acceleration programs. We got in, involved in an acceleration program in Mexico, which is called Reto Zapopan. Then we were selected by Startup Chile for seeds uh, generation 20. We got a, a, a free equity fund there for $80,000. So we had enough money to rebuild up so our software. You know, our firstborn wasn't really you know, functional. We didn't know what to do very much with software. I mean, my associate and I are biomedical engineers. We are not coders. We are not developers. So there was a lot to learn. And I have, you know, some terror stories that I could share with you. <laughs> you know, starting out with uh, how do you hire your first developer when you don't know what PHP means or .NET means or, you know, all of those. So I just remember myself having those interviews with uh, the developers, like asking, like, hey, like, tell me about yourself. Tell me in one language you code. Oh, well, I use this technology. And I'm like, yeah, sure. It's amazing. And then the other one came and the other one came. So we ended up hiring a, a friend of ours, which was, a, you know, rather than a, rather than a highly well-recognized person in the field or with someone with a high resume or whatever, it was a, a really, really intelligent guy, which we knew on a personal basis uh, from a long time. And we decided to hire our first CTO. And then uh, he, he's still with us on the team. He's not our CTO anymore. He's our tech lead. Uh, and uh, Startup Chile was practically part of that change for us. So we started out with 35 customers, received this grant, we built uh, our software 2.0. And then from there, we scaled from 35 to 110 in the first years. Uh, and then now, uh, after Startup Chile program, we received the extension. We, I came back to Mexico. I went there and lived uh, a year and a half in Santiago, Chile, then came back to Mexico and, um, we won the, how do you call this? There's an entrepreneurship festival, which is, a, the, I think this is the most famous one in Latin America. It's called Inc. Monterrey. It's organized by a very, 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 very famous university here, and which is also very, very prestigious. And we won uh, first place there in the first competition, the pitch competition. Congrats. And uh, well, that, that has been you know, part of our, our journey so far. We still have a lot to do. Uh, we raised the pre-series A on, on March, in the first week of March for $300,000. And uh, well, now we're in this war, war against COVID. You know, healthcare is a huge topic right now, but it's not how everybody thinks that the uh, hospitals are rich right now, that they're receiving a lot of money. I mean, <laughs> the only that's available is to buy, you know, ventilators and critical equipment. Uh, and also some consumable. So uh, we are struggling as every other company is, uh, but we are helping out in any way we can. That's, that's an amazing uh, uh, introduction and, and story. Congrats for, for it. And uh, yeah, maybe this is, we always discuss on the show three critical ingredients to scale. Number one is radical focus. Number two is world-class leadership. And number three is uh, culture of um, execution. Starting with, with number one, radical focus, you anticipated already that maybe we were betting that healthcare would be one of the few uh, industries that would be maybe benefiting from this pandemic crisis. But as we are seeing, uh, it's, it's not the case. So they are really, really busy uh, uh, fighting against COVID-19 and there is no, no uh, extra space to, to discuss uh, another, another project. So how, how did you refocus, reassess the environment and uh, replan it 2020 after such uh, intense eight weeks since you have moved it to uh, lockdown and quarantine in, in Mexico and in your company? Well, COVID-19 has brought great opportunities for the health, healthcare sector, that's, that's for sure. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I was talking with the, with the person uh, about two days ago and she told me, Luis, why doesn't the investors in Latin America invest in medical technology? Because right now something really, really funny is happening. And I'll tell you something. In Mexico, we depend very much on foreign technology. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, uh, you know, all of the brands of medical equipment that you can think of are not from Mexico. 
So as, as you would can, as you would imagine, there's a lot of dependency on hospitals for these foreign brands. So when COVID struck, uh, we had a big problem because there is not enough medical equipment in the world. And of course, the, the, the companies that develop this medical equipment in their own countries are trying to help out their own countries. So when you want to buy a, a medical ventilator, let's say you get, I mean, four to eight weeks of delivery and, you know, you don't have four to eight weeks of delivery. So there's, there's, a, there's something really nice that happened in Mexico. There's a lot of uh, makers and developers, you know, sort of in the hackathon mindset that uh, they said they discovered this problem, of course, that there weren't any enough ventilators and, and that the ones that there are available, some of them, a huge percentage of them are not working. So they need maintenance and et cetera. So a lot of people started building me mechanical ventilators and there's a lot of information in the news that the MIT shared their, their blueprint so that people could develop ventilators, et cetera. And, and then I think uh, Medtronic did the same thing. So there's a lot of people really working on, on projects re regarding uh, medical devices. But the thing is that most of them um, don't, I mean, most of the people that are developing these technologies are not biomedical equipment. I mean, biomedical engineers, they're mechanical engineers, they're electronic engineers. And of course, they have all the skill sets available to develop uh, medical technology. But I mean, they're, in their mind, medical equipment is just another machine. And that is not the case for a machine that is going to be used on a patient. So many of them don't, don't know that it's not about just building a machine. It's about you know, building a machine, validating its safety, uh, of course, getting into the regulatory processes, because, for example, in the States, you have the FDA, and here we have another agency that everything related to medical technology and, and healthcare get, needs to, you know, get this document uh, of approval. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a big thing. It's a social thing that a lot of people are working on these projects, but many of them are lacking the patient safety focus and all of the regulatory processes that need to be developed. Actually, like, just imagine if, if, if you're someone that's in your house and building uh, mechanical ventilators with your friends or, or in a university on, or, or maybe it's just another business that is pivoting and has a technology to, to build these machines. Um, but what about post-sale, like a post-sale service? Like what if the device fails? Do you have you know, a, a service manual? Do you have spare parts? Do you even know which are the you know, which are the, the parts that you're going to need. So it's not that easy. And I, and I do think that 2020 is going to be, it's going to be a year of many opportunities in the healthcare sector, but are, but are not going to flourish just yet because medical devices is, is something that is not, that, that you don't validate in two months. The, the minimum viable product or, or service in the healthcare sector, you know, especially related to medical devices, is not something that you can't just validate it one week or one month, for example, it's not the same on the restaurant industry, or it's not the same on the entertainment industry. It's, it's, you know, it's a peculiar thing, which is right now, I think bringing a great opportunity to, to entrepreneurs and, and innovators, uh, but it's not going to flourish just yet. So people that are willing to participate in, in healthcare entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship, or even investing, need to know that, uh, you know, it's going to take a while for, for them to see results. So I think it's going to be interesting. I think the healthcare sector is going to be, you know, on the watch of many uh, VC funds, uh, angel investors around the world. And I think that, you know, it's going to be tough because uh, at least in Mexico, we, are, we lack the mechanisms to validate uh, medical technology in a fast and efficient way. So I think there's going to be a lot of challenges as well. So we, we had one of the founders of the CS category or for the ones who are not familiar with CS customer success, uh, mm -hmm. which means about retaining current customers and growing through existing clients. Um, is this a year of, of CS versus acquisition of, of new customers? Uh, is this something that you are thinking in terms of uh, refocusing your, your targets for, for 2020? and waiting for um, the, the right timing to attack again in, in 2021. Uh, what is success for you in, in 2020 uh, after this pandemic crisis uh, emerges? You know, you, you said it very, very correctly. Um, 
our software uh, is something that helps the hospital optimize their resources. It's an investment. It's not, it's not really a, a, an expense, or we see it that way, because if you own a medical equipment management software, you get the chance to measure what's going on with your medical equipment throughout its lifecycle. For example, when you, let's say you buy a car, and the car is going to cost you $20,000 or $10,000 or whatever. So you're going to purchase that car, and uh, throughout it, I mean, let's say that the, that the manufacturer says that it's going to last about 10 years or five years or whatever. So you know how, like, you know that if you spend, uh, that if you spend on, on servicing, repair, repairing, et cetera, a large percentage of the, of the acquisition cost of that asset or passive, depending on the focus that you see it, um, you know, it's it, on the first five years, it's going to be a problem because at the end of the day, you know, you can buy another car maybe with, with that money. Right. Uh, so many of us don't have the culture of, you know, just writing down each expense regarding our, our vehicle. Let's say whenever you change the tires, whenever you change the, a component, whenever you take it to the, to the service agency, et cetera. And that gives us a lot of uncertainty financially regarding when we need to change the car because it's, it's, it's more, most probably to be more expensive than buying another one. So at the end of the day, the, the hospital not, not only owns one asset, but thousands of assets. So most of the hospitals here in Mexico don't do a, a mid, you know, a, a, an assessment of the expenses of, of each medical technology because they don't have the data to do so. So, so we are, are, you know, we are in between the C-suite and the operational area of the clinical engineers because our software is not only focused on standardizing practices of medical equipment managers, but also on providing data for decision-making. Let's say that you wanna open another hospital, you wanna construct another hospital, and you want to equip that hospital with lots of technology. Which technology should you buy? Uh, we don't have that blue book for, for medical equipment. So we want to be the first uh, medical equipment management agency that produces the data in order to, let's say, I mean, I, I don't need to, I don't mean to, to get into commercial stuff, but you know, this data that we're producing and that many other companies can produce is really important and really needed for regulation. And, uh, I think that what you said was really, really, really correct because most of our customers are, you know, they are getting money uh, from this pandemic. Of course, uh, I was speaking to one of our, of our customers, uh, general manager, and he said, you know, people think that there's a lot of patients, you know, waiting in line outside a hospital. That is not true. Actually, most of the hospitals, uh, a big percentage of the hospitals are collapsing. And they are uh, going in bankruptcy because they're not managing correctly the business side. So it's not, it's not a matter of more patients, but the mix of the patients is really different. So right now, uh, they are attaining uh, respiratory, uh, let's say, patients. And that de demands, you know, respiratory uh, resources, such as mechanical ventilators. So uh, for us, it's a little bit tough uh, in the sales part because they're more focused on infrastructure on medical technology than a software that is going to help them, you know, manage their resources. So <laughs> we have had a lot of customers already um, told us like we were not getting any budget to, to renovate this year for you uh, because, you know, the, the resources are, are allocated to, to somewhere else. So what we did is we, we made an interesting pivot. Um, we converted our SaaS into a freemium model because, uh, our, our biggest, biggest competitor is Microsoft Excel. <laughs> and, uh, and it's really funny because uh, we said, okay, so if, you know, if everybody is using Excel to manage their inventories and they're having huge pain in the ass, why don't we build an Excel version of our software so that people can get, can do the same stuff that they already do on Excel, but on our software. And if, and if we convince them enough to be a practical resource and something really cool and awesome and, and productive for them, uh, well, maybe they're, they're, they're going to buy the premium uh, version. And uh, we launched our freemium uh, four week, three weeks ago, actually, and we have uh, made a huge progress uh, with hospitals. Unfortunately, not as much as we wanted because all of the clinical engineers are busy right now. So we, we are working more on the customer success. We are telling them, because 
of course, if you own the software, the, your first barrier of entry is you need to you need to introduce you need to load your assets into the inventory. And there are so those are thousands of assets, and you can do them one by one or whatever. But you know that takes time. So what we're doing right now is offering them free uh, inventory uploads. Uh, we'll help you out with the with the inventory. And of course, our 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 uh, collaborators are just like. That they, they want to rip their faces off because it's it, you know it's a lot of work, but we have uh, very high hopes that uh, this pandemic will help us not only advance in our business but also to talk more about the clinical engineering culture. Talk about why is it important to manage your assets and manage your equipment uh, in a correct way because at the end of the day, uh, you need to know what is your current installed base of medical equipment for you to know how many patients you're going to be able to attend. So uh, it's more of a too much success here. Yes, of yeah, remo removing barriers of entry uh, or entry barriers, and uh, and of course also being seen as a category leader uh, in in the space who provides um, thought leadership uh, insights for for your target market. Something that is important uh, nowadays, and that everyone is investing much more, is also in. Uh, high quality content that is really, really re relevant for um, our audience. And in terms of the second topic, which is world class leadership, um, how are you? How are you dealing, or how are you? What are you doing in order to to stay strong and healthy as a leader, so you can be a, a good mirror for your team? And um, are you adjusting anything in terms of uh, your team composition so you are better prepared for wartime mode instead of peacetime mode? Yes. So I mean, my my late my life changed radically in the past two months. Uh, I was I was going to go to propose to my girlfriend in, who lives in Chile on April, and and you know when this uh, pandemic started, uh, you know everything changed. Um, not only personal uh, matters, but also professional matters needed to be placed on hold. My sister, uh, who, uh, who has a, a klein living syndrome, which is a, a, a disease related to sleep issues, she, she waited eight years to graduate and just graduated yesterday without her family there with her in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And... Uh, you know, many people had to postpone weddings and, uh, you know, it's, it's huge. Right, right now, I think we're facing the, the most global event in history of mankind because, of course, we, we've had Second World War, et cetera, but I don't, I don't think that, you know, the World Wars were as globally connected as, as right now we were. We are. Uh, so, and, and I'm talking about myself, but, you know, imagine my colleagues, imagine my partners, each and every one of us has a story to tell. There's people that, you know, were really enthusiastic about, you know, traveling to hospitals and meeting new people and getting to know new clinical engineers, uh, you know, and it's, and it's tough. So right now, I, I, uh, my, in my mind, I am still working, but now twice as, as hard because a lot of distractions are, you know, at, are at the end of the, uh, at the point of the door, you know, my parents, uh, my brother and sister uh, calls, WhatsApp, my bed. You know, there's it's tough to work from home, but at the end of the day, you have to face it and you have to, uh, you know, just uh, start jumping those barriers or removing those thresholds or, or triggers that get you distracted. So, a lot of, uh, of my my mindset right now is how to avoid distraction and how to stay focused on my goals. So, I am reading this uh, book called this book called Indistractable, which is really, really good example of, of small things and adjustments that you can make, which has helped me very, very good, not only on making small changes for myself, but also for my team. So well, it's really important for a leader to know what the results are going to be or what, what, do, what results do you need to meet, especially if you have investors. Uh, of course, that your results maybe are going to change because of this pandemic, but you have to work twice or triple as hard in order for you to be less impacted uh, by this pandemic. So the, the way that we're thinking right now is we have the results already uh, promised, let's say, and now we have to think about what skills do we need to enhance in order for us to be twice as productive than we thought we were going to be before. So 
we're doing a lot of adjustments on on the skill sets. Uh, we're we're receiving a lot of training on on Udemy courses, for example, on the Harvard courses that are right now online. So we're doing a lot of training right now, so that we can enhance our our ways of being because we don't have the chance to meet face to face and to show those uh, the, those people who are willing to work what is the right way to do the job. I mean. Uh, Platforms like Zoom, uh, StreamYard, et cetera, have been of great, great help. We meet on a regular basis, of course, but there's nothing compared for you to be in the same room with a colleague and just have a good conversation over coffee to discuss results and to talk about uh, development of the company. So right now we're, we're focused on developing, on developing skills and also on, uh, you know, just helping on the, on the, personal side as well. I mean, this, uh, this pandemic is also causing social stress uh, and there's a lot of uh, cases of depression, uh, which we're looking out for to try to keep motivated uh, our team as much as possible, sharing the good news, especially the small news as much as possible. For example, hey, I talked to this customer today and he told me that this, <coughs> this function is really good. Hey, I talked to this person right now and she's really interested on trying our new tool. Just a uh, you know, small things that can let them know that they like it's uh, really important. And I think that that uh, we have done a good, I would say not the uh, best, because there's always room for improvement. But, uh, you know, that's that's what we're doing right now during war times. That's, that's amazing. Celebrating the small wins, uh, it's really important, especially when you need to overcome um, uh, all SaaS companies and all uh, growing companies have uh, huge milestones and ambitious goals in terms of growth. And, and being able to adapt to the new reality can be very painful. And just saying we need to retain our current customers and avoid churn and try to, to see if there is opportunities to upsell. Uh, and we, we might need to be planting the growth for the upcoming year. Uh, and not be obsessed about having growth already this year. So for a company that is, which number one priority is always growth, <laughs> this is really, really painful for, for just for the audience to resonate with, with the founders and CEOs and executives that are uh, leading these, these companies to, to success. It's a huge uh, mindset mindset shift uh, in such a short period of time, and in terms of um, the working from home routines, you're talking about um, the the book that you have been reading. Uh, is there any specific practice or rhythm that is helping you to keep the the, the team on on the same page? So do you have any all ends uh, kind of a daily any routine that is being especially good for you that might might help the audience? Uh, to apply as well. Yes. So, so in one of the in one of the chapters of this book, uh, which I really really recommend, is uh, there's a comparison between the to do lists and the time boxing. Um, I am a huge fan of to do lists, but also I sort of repel the the, the to do lists because I get stressed if I if there's still things there, I get stressed the fuck out, like really 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 stressed. Like I'm like oh my God, I have 150 tasks that I haven't completed, et cetera. So when I started reading this book, I started changing to the time boxing. And the time boxing is really, really simple. You just grab an Excel spreadsheet. On the columns, you put the days. On the, on the rows, you put the hours. Let's say 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, et cetera. And according to your profile, you have to reserve time to do the, the special, I mean, the most important tasks of your day. So let's say that you're involved in sales and your end goal is to sell. So if you don't, if you're not dedicating enough time to sell, you're never going to accomplish the results. So for example, in time boxing, the only thing that you do, and it's really simple, is that you reserve uh, a couple or three or four hours on as many a time as you need in order to do one thing only, but do it right. So for example, if you, if you have a, a goal, let's say of talking to 200 new possible customers or prospects, or you need to call, or you need to incorporate, let's say 50 new prospects each month. So you need to reserve time to make those calls and uh, you need time, especially to develop a dialogue or, 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 or let's say a set of words that you're going to talk about, because right now every, every, everyone is trying to sell something in healthcare. 
you don't know how many calls everyone receives to get offered something. Right now, there's people doing antibacterial gel in their homes, in their liquefier. And I'm not joking. This is, this is, this is uh, dangerous. So everybody is selling something in healthcare these days. So uh, we need to reserve time as well to plan our calls to, let's say, uh, choose the right words that we're going to choose in order for him to talk. Uh, so, you know, time boxing is really, really important. Uh, and it has really made a huge difference in, in my routine at first. I am still yet to try it out with the team uh, because I'm trying to configure out the, the, the best way to do it with the team. But right now, uh, we've been working with the to-do lists and uh, it has been working good, I would say, not excellent. But we know which are the tasks that we need to do week by week. So. We, we meet, I meet uh, personally with the team, each uh, member at least once or twice a week. Uh, it's really important to maintain con uh, contact, especially, and, I, and I'm not meaning this in a really bad way, but in a really productive way. Um, since you're not seeing your employees in their office, or you're not having uh, enough meetings face-to-face, -face, yeah. results are going to be impacted because you don't know what the other person is doing. Of course, there's trust. And you know that the salespeople are going to do their calls, but what if they don't? So you want to set those uh, thermometers or those, uh, let's say, alarm points uh, so that you can assure that the results are being delivered. And, and also to, to have personal chats with your team and assure that they're feeling okay, that they're not feeling depressed, that they're not feeling... And if they are, I mean, just send them a book through Amazon or... or uh, you know, invite them to see a movie with you on Netflix. Uh, I mean, just uh, try to spend as much personal time as possible because not everything is work. And uh, at least in Tink, we consider ourselves to be family. Uh, <coughs> and we spend, uh, you know, in our job, we spend more time with our colleagues than we do with our families. So at the end of the day, there has to be a strong relationship and, and you need to reserve time as well to spend uh, time with your colleagues in uh you know just have a beer on friday at 4 or 5 p.m have a coffee uh talk about what they're doing in their houses what video game are they playing what are they reading and you know just uh, follow the conversation over there you're still human you're not only you know a, a business machine you need to build a strong confidence with your team and the way to do it is by supporting your colleagues not not only just uh, uh you know, talking about results and talking about the problems and talking about how everything is going to, you know, change radically. Um, also, I would like to mention the, the sports, you know, try to do as much as exercise as possible and do it as early as possible. So your mindset can be completely, completely on and activated for you to start doing what you want to do in the next couple of, of days. A lot of people have been telling me, and, and as an example of myself as well, we've, you know, we've been gaining weight, you know, everything hurts because we can go jogging, we can go to the gym, etc. So having a routine of 45 minutes to an hour of uh, whatever you can do, if it's squats, if it's push-ups, uh, if it's running around your house, you know, whatever you can do, or, or maybe you can buy one of these uh, uh, YouTube videos and you can do some exercise there, jumping around, etc. So uh, I would say that and uh, have enough time as well. Uh, and this has helped me a lot for myself. Um, you know, as a CEO, we tend ourselves to pressure us a lot and uh, to be driven to the result that we want to get. We are really passionate. We are obsessed with the idea. We are obsessed with the, with the business. And we tend to forget. And I say this on, a, on, a, on an example of myself. Uh, I, I was really sick of, you know, not sleeping, eating badly, eating poorly. So just uh, try to be as healthy as possible and to set the example as better as possible for your colleagues. Because at the end of the day, if there is, uh, you know, everybody's replaceable, even the CEO, but the founders are not. The founders are the ones who have the idea, who've lived the pain points, who've talked to as much people as possible. So you can maybe uh, you know just just talk to someone to do the things that you do but as a founder as a creator of, of this business uh, you know it's hard not to be there and, and not to be uh, helping the, the the team grow so I'm not telling that the founders can never leave or or, or or that we're not replaceable but our role in the early stages of a startup is crucial because there's not there's not a lot of things to 
I mean, there's in the startup, there's not a lot of processes well established. Everything is pivoting. Everything is a progressive collaboration. Uh, you know, it's, it's chaos in a good sense. Uh, and when that chaos, you know, as a CEO and as a founder, you're the leader of that chaos. You know, everybody might, might be rowing, you know, intensely and not knowing where they're going, but you are the one who is seeing where the ship is going. So you need to maintain yourself as healthy as possible and to help all your colleagues in any way you can, both, uh, first of all, personally, and second of all, second, uh, professionally. Amazing, Luis. I really appreciate the, 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 the candid way that you have uh, helped us to go through your own uh, learnings and uh, great stuff that you shared with the community today. So we come to the last question and our favorite question of the show, which is if you would have the opportunity to start up again, think um, and to meet Luis uh, in 2018, so kind of two or three years ago, what advice would you offer to your younger self? So I love this question. I love this question because it's, it's uh, time to reflect about what you could have done and what you did and what you didn't do. Uh, um, you know, if I would see myself in two or three years ago, I'm going to talk about myself in 2015 or maybe in 2012 when I started looking at medical equipment inventories and I said, oh my fucking God, this cannot be possible. <laughs> it's be possible that the government doesn't know how many devices there are. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really a, a, a bad experience and a good experience. So I was really unmotivated because I didn't, I didn't know if I had studied the right thing. Uh, you know, because at the end of the day, you want to you wanna feel recognized, you want to feel developed, you want to feel successful, you know? And, uh, Whenever I meet someone uh, and, and they ask me, what, what, did, what, what was your bachelor degree about? And I was just like, it's biomedical engineering. And everyone's just like, oh my God, that's so cool. You must be rich, but I don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> so the, you know, <laughs> sounds really, really futuristic and, and, and uh, you know, even related to like uh, sci-fi movies or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we do do all of those stuff. Like we, we develop uh, artificial uh, hearts, uh, 3D printing, uh, artificial intelligence, and robots and everything. You know, it's stuff that biomedical engineers are doing uh, worldwide, but uh, you know, there's areas. And if people don't know what a biomedical engineer does, they won't know what a clinical engineer does, you know? So, 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 so I had a, a huge challenge on recognition because we are, uh, as clinical engineers, the unseen heroes in a hospital uh, because I'm going to tell you this, uh, I'm a medical practitioner, let's say a doctor, a nurse, or, or a, a first, um, or an emergency uh, personnel that is in an ambulance, they need two things to do their job. The first one is, of course, the knowledge of medicine, the knowledge of, of what the, how the body works and, and what to do in case of, of seeing uh, something not in the ordinary, uh, let's say, parameters, okay? Uh, and the second is tools. Well, which doctor or nurse or emergency personnel diagnoses, treats, or rehabilitates a patient without a medical equipment? I mean, at least in the, in the, in the new medicine, in the high-tech medicine, we depend a lot of technology. So we are, not, we are now the clinical engineers. We are seen mostly as the firefighters because we are called only when something is not working. Most of the time. So... Right. Our challenge as professionals is to change this mindset into, you know, becoming not only recognized uh, profile in our profession, but also to be a relevant profile in our profession, because we can make a lot of a lot of uh, good in hospitals. And I feel that our professionals still needs to, you know, keep pushing harder for us to get into the decision makers in the hospital, so that we don't see. Uh, you know, huge struggles like the pandemic that we're living today, where we don't know, and this is, this is true. In Mexico, we don't know how many devices there are. We don't know in what state they are. We don't know how many we need to buy for sure. And we don't know what the budget exactly needs to be for us to procure new devices, which is stupid. And, and I say this with all of my heart. It, in, a, in an age of data, we don't know what the current baseline of medical equipment are because you know, we haven't made small changes in our, in our system. And I think that my advice uh, to my younger self would be exactly that. Uh, 
Don't get unmotivated. Uh, don't get frustrated if people don't know what you do. You are going to get to a point in your career where, where everything makes sense. And it wasn't Tink, I have to be honest, it's not Tink, it's COVID-19. COVID-19 for me was a, is, it was a game changer because I realized that my profession made the most relevant out of everything that I thought it would be. And I've had the opportunity to talk to ministries of health, to the WHO. I now collaborate with the clinical engineering division of the International Federation for Medicine and Biology. And uh, it's, it's really interesting what's going on. So I think that my advice to my younger self is uh, study more, get more prepared, talk to more people because the stuff that is coming is going to really, really put your life at challenge. And uh, I never thought that uh, we'd be the only clinical engineering startup that has raised money, uh, that has uh, won, uh, you know, the startup Chile, uh, well, not won, but was in the extension program, the Inc. Monterrey Prize. So uh, out of that, my, my best recognition was that now more people know what the clinical engineer is all about. Uh, like, of course, I care about Tink and I care about the prices and, and, the, and the challenges. But what I'm mostly happy about is that more people know what my profession is about. And, and hopefully that will change uh, the perspective of some leaders if they get the chance to see what we do. Awesome. Uh, Luis, I, I love a, a sentence. I, I think it's from Jim Ron who kind of summarizes what you just said, which is, don't wish it was uh, easier, wish you were uh, better. So that's, that's the amazing uh, way of kind of summarizing your, your last thoughts. Uh, Luis, thanks so much for making the time to, to share your experience with us today and some insights to be uh, applied uh, straight away by our listeners. My pleasure, Mike, and uh, hopefully uh, this uh, small talk uh, can inspire others to keep pushing forward uh, in these uh, uh, challenging times. I wish uh, that everyone listening is safe. Uh, please wash your hands and please uh, please follow the Ministry of Health and the WHO uh, guidelines on COVID-19 because uh, this is this is real. This is really harmful. And uh, you know, if we promote this culture of collaboration around the world, where people can be healthy and following you know, just uh, basic uh, health procedures, I think this will be over soon. So I, I really wish that uh, people that are listening to us uh, have hope in their businesses, have hope in their startups. And, uh, you know, if they, if they need anything, they can contact me through the Scale Up Valley uh, podcast. Awesome, Luis, thanks again. And to our community, as Luis was saying, we keep here bringing you the best of the best to inspire you to keep scaling during COVID-19 uh, times or to be prepared to scale when, the, when everything gets back to, to normal. Stay healthy, stay strong. We, we come back very soon. Keep scaling. Music